Hello, hello. Hi, Rabbi. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Fine. How are the kids doing? A little crazy, but good. Are you surviving having them home with the schooling? Surviving is a good word. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're getting there. It's, every day is uh, its own little adventure. But between just their schoolwork and just them being home together a lot, mm -hmm. uh, trying to keep all three of them from uh, getting on each other's nerves is its own uh, little, little experiment each day. So, how's the baby doing? Thank God. He's just at that age now where he is getting into everything. And, uh, <laughs> it makes the homeschooling a little harder when you're trying to keep the, uh, the baby from grabbing Legos and everything else from grabbing <laughs> off the floor. And, and so uh, it's really been, it's, been, it's exciting. You know, it's great to see his development and his growth. And it's like just at that time now where he's just tearing into everything. I have some friends who are doing the homeschooling, uh, some teachers who are doing the uh, teaching online. And yeah. they said that's a whole different experience right there. It is. I mean, you know, her the, the teachers have been doing a nice job, I think. Like uh, Ari's teacher, uh, you know, she's on, I think, every day for a little while, uh, answer the kids' questions, have been sending home assignments. Uh, they've been using it again, like for unless you're used to technology, it's gotta be all new for them too. So the fact that they've been able to do so much with such little time, I think is pretty impressive. And so, well, it's good if, if the parents are helping out and doing it at home, it makes a big difference. Oh, they have to be. They have to be helping. I mean, you know, that's really the issue is that, you know, for parents, especially with younger kids, but even with older kids, you can't like be doing your work and also like try to navigate them through 10 different lessons a day that I've been posted on uh, their Microsoft Teams account. You know, like he's 10, you know, and Chai is six. You know, it's like they need adult supervision and adult help to get through this work. Well, I'm glad you're young. You can do it. I can do it. I, I got the energy. God bless. And just uh, working hard with it. Thank God. It's going well. That's good. good evening, everyone. Hi, Debbie. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Oh, Ooh. Tony's here. Look at this. Tony, I haven't seen you in so long. <laughs> she's connecting to audio. I see she's connecting. There she is. Hello. Oh, hello. Everybody. How are you? Good, good. How's everyone? So far, so good. Perfect. You? Tony, I see what I told you about is very true now that I see your face. What's that? <laughs> What did and I found oh, on the yeah, I, without a question. <laughs> Rabbi, it's an internal joke, Rabbi. Sorry about it. I'll take it. It's okay. <laughs> it's fine by me. <laughs> we, oh, we, had a, we had a we total, com here. total computer meltdown today. All four computers are dead. You're oh, no. Awful. Awful. Yeah. Mm. Did you get it fixed or did you find out what happened? Well, John is working on the big computer with, with Apple. We, we just don't get any emails and everything is erased. It's, it's horrible. I hate computers. <laughs> <laughs> it's an adventure now, put it that way, because we're also reliant on them even more than before. I know. Uh, I, know. And my, uh, I gave it an Ahara. That's what happened. Ah, it got you in the end. I don't know. No, my uh, my laptop that I use, you know, for home and for work, uh, it's now the battery is not recharging. And so uh, if, it, if I plug it in, it works, but everything uh, if I take it out, it, it it crashes immediately. And so I'm actually using a Federation laptop. So that's always helpful. How about the old-fashioned notebook and pencil? It'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Makes this a little harder though. You're right. You need to have something. But uh, yeah, it's um, it's uh, definitely a challenge. And if all four go down at once, you got a big problem. We wouldn't be able to connect to each other with a pen and a pencil. <laughs> well, it's also that, you know, Elizabeth, her phone, she dropped it and cracked the screen. And some of the places that fix that have been deemed non-essential businesses. So they're uh, closed. Wow. It's open though, I think. Man, <laughs> 
Okay. I'm gonna just get us going here. As you can see, I have my synagogue background, so in our hearts, so we can be in the synagogue. That's nice. It looks very pretty. Yeah. Well, you're not there? No. Oh my god. It's an illusion. Wow. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now, David, know, are you there? I don't know Debbie Siegel. Hi, Debbie Siegel. Hello, I'm Debbie Siegel. I'm here in Clearwater Beach from New York. Where in New York? Rockland County near West Point. Okay. Beautiful spot. Yes. Okay, well, so, is there, David out here? I, I see he's here, his... but I think he's, he's, his video isn't on. You there, David? Okay, he's not connecting. Yeah, because it, it says that he's on, but yeah. Hi, it's Susan Ellis. Oh, oh hi, yeah, Susan. hi, Susan. Hi, but I have to do some tasks, so I didn't want to make noise and interrupt, but I wanted to hear. Uh, okay, cool. So I'm going to go mute again if I can. That's fine. If I can figure it out. How do I get the volume up? Susan, there's a, there's a mute button on the left-hand side on the bottom. You have to move your cursor there. Oh, they're good. They're already muted. Uh, okay. So Tony, for the, for, for the volume... Um, that should just be on your end of the computer. Yeah. Uh, and, and so uh, if you have um, a volume control, usually it's in the bottom uh, right hand side. Right, and, it, and it's not. I'm sorry, I didn't that's get your right. name. I see John. Uh, what? That's, oh, that's, to that's Tony Rindy. What is and your, what is your think, name? I My see, name? Yes. Tony, oh. Tony Rindy. Tony? Yeah. Oh, Tony. Okay. Yeah. And I and I see Bob there too. Bob, can you hear us? This is a little. It looks frozen to me. I see Paul Mansfield. Yeah, uh, but that's Bob. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The wonders of tech. Back to paper and pen might be the worst idea <laughs> after all. Mm -hmm. All this stuff going on. Okay, paper and pen was probably good enough for our uh, subject today. Uh, we have Amos. Uh, I don't see. Oh, it's Amos. I think I hear hear Bob coming in. A bit. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna do that until. Okay. There he goes. Okay. You may have to hit the screen. Okay. So anyway, uh, Amos, uh, who is a, a, a prophet, a prophet. He was uh, born in Judea, uh, in Judah. Uh, but then he did most of his work up north in Israel. This is the time when the kingdoms split, and so he was uh, actually a shepherd uh, by trade. And then God calls him to do this prophetic work. He lived during the first half of the 8th century during the reigns of King Jeroboam of Israel and King Uzziah of Judah. Uh, and it was great you know, in terms of this, the, um, the state of, the, of both nations. There was not a lot of war or conflict at that moment in time. It was getting close, but not a lot of war and conflict. So it was a time of peace and a time of prosperity. So what can be bad? What can we have in terms of a prophet? What's he going to be railing against? is gonna be against the social inequities. He's gonna have um, a lot of trouble with the way that the poor in the community are being treated uh, by the elites. And so that's gonna be a major theme of his prophecy. Uh, he, ah, there we go. So he spoke about uh, inequality. He spoke about justice and righteousness as they all do. Uh, he used the term day of the eternal a lot in his work that it was viewed by uh, the people who heard this phrase, day of the eternal, day of the eternal, as a very positive thing, like a holiday celebration. We're going to go celebrate the day of the eternal. Uh, for uh, Amos, he says that the day of the eternal is not going to be a good thing. 
it's going to be a time for divine uh, judgment and retribution and punishment for all things that are going badly in society. So you shouldn't wish for the day uh, of the Lord. You shouldn't wish for the day of the eternal to come because when it happens, it's not going to be uh, very pleasant. And of course, a deep concern uh, with just ethics writ large. The book itself is most likely a compilation, uh, probably more than one source, probably more than one author. Uh, it's eventually redacted into the works of uh, Amos, but we have really no idea who wrote these words down, whether it was one singular individual whose words were compiled into a, a book, or it's more than one author. We do have, again, a better sense of dating, you know, in the 8th century uh, BCE, but we don't have a great sense necessarily of, again, who the primary author was, if there was indeed an Amos, since these are all uh, his words. Uh, as opposed to Ezekiel, who we studied uh, a little bit last time, who was more of an ecstatic prophet. He did uh, a lot of symbolism, a lot of visions, a lot of, you know, build this, you know, create that and demonstrate to the people by way of metaphor uh, what's going to happen. Uh, Amos is a little more old school. Amos is, you know, right. basically saying, uh, this is what God says. Thus says the eternal, etc. You know, and then he's going to give the, a lot of speeches. His book is mostly speeches. And he has maybe one narrative piece in the entire thing but it's mostly first person uh, speeches that he's giving. Um, the, the speeches we look at today, uh, the first two chapters, it's an, basically a ethical tour uh, of the region. He's going to talk about what's going on in the society at large. Uh, three through six is a collection of prophetic speeches uh, that castigate Israel for injustice. And seven through nine are uh, visions and other prophecies as well. Also, of course, as they always end with, a message of comfort. Uh, with all that said, we're going to now dive into the text itself. Uh, I'm going to get us going here. I'm going to share our screen. Okay. So you should see chapter one. And as we uh, begin our study of the Bible, let's join together in the blessing. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam Asher Kedishanu B'mitzvotah B'mitzvotah La'asot Hebrei Torah Okay, excellent. Okay, Debbie, would you like to begin for us today? Yes. <clears throat> the words of Amos, a sheep reader from Tekoa. And I can close any of this. Okay, I'll start again. Yes. The words of Amos, a sheep reader from Tekoa, who prophesied concerning Israel in the reigns of kings Uzziah of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel two years before the earthquake, he proclaimed, the internal roars from Zion shouts aloud from Jerusalem and the pastures of the shepherds shall languish and the summit of Carmel shall wither. Okay, and so one thing we note here is that we have this earthquake that happens. It's actually mentioned in another prophetic work as well. There was a time right around uh, when he was doing his work there was actually a major earthquake. We have archaeological evidence that backs that up, wow. uh, which I think is, again, pretty cool that <laughs> we have something like that. And then, of course, it gives you, again, the timing uh, of, his, um, of his work, right, during these different reigns of kings, uh, Uzziah uh, and then Jeroboam, as we mentioned. Uh, and uh, right away, the eternal roars, you know, God shouts. Uh, and that's going to be a big deal because when God talks, you best listen. Now we're going to get a little tour of the nations, as I mentioned. Uh, and so you're going to see this phrasing uh, a few times for three transgressions for four. So basically what that means is there's a lot of problems happening here. It's, it's, a, it's a rhetorical device. Okay. So it's a how much the more so it's, oh my goodness, there's so much sin going on kind of a statement. Okay. So it's for three and for four. So it's just, it's, when you just see it, you have to think about the idea of that's a lot of sin going on. That's a lot of problems that are happening here. Uh, Marilyn, do you want to pick up over here? Thus said the eternal. 
sure. Let's set the eternal. The three transgressions of Damascus before, I will not revoke it. Because they thresh Gilead with threshing boards of iron, I will send down fires upon the palace of Hazael, and it shall devour the fortress of Ben Hadad. I will break the gate bars of Damascus and wipe out the inhabitants from the valley of Aben and the sceptre ruler of Ben Eden. And the people of Iran shall be ex exiled to Kerr, said the Eternal. Okay, excellent. So we have a lot of history there, um, and we can get into it in terms of just the, um, the, the details here. Damascus is like the capital of Syria. Uh, Gilead was an Israelite territory in northern Transjordan, uh, which was very vulnerable, uh, as it is today, uh, to Syrian aggression, right? Uh, and so threshing itself, you thresh grain, you thresh wheat, uh, it has uh, some symbolism uh, of violence, you know, that, that it is uh, an act of destruction or an act of this, you know, of, of force, of tearing. Uh, and so that's why you get that. Um, that terminology here, it's supposed to be very um, evocative. Uh, people are just, you know, are rulers, you know, so Hazael was a ruler, Ben Hadad, you know, another ruler, um, you know, these you know, other places. Trouble's coming, you know, to Syria, right? The, That's the general thought. This is Amos saying this? Amos, yeah. Amos, Amos is saying this. Yeah, Amos is saying this. So he's observing what's going on, basically. He's observing what's going on. What I I envision, you know, so one one or two images come to mind. The classical image that we have, uh, that I have, I should say, is you think about, you know, a guy in a town square uh, that has a microphone, you know, sort of on the street, and he's just yelling at the top of his lungs. Like, now we think these people are crazy, you know. Uh, and maybe they thought he was crazy too, uh, but that, that that image comes to mind. Hey, everybody, you know what's happening? The other image that I often have is, frankly, uh, stand-up comedians uh, that you know they're up in front of a big audience. They have they have captivated. Uh, they have a captive audience. It's a stay, almost like a staging area. It's not literally what it was. But I'm saying that's the image that comes to mind. And they get a microphone. Hey, you ever think about what happened here? You know, and they're just they're doing you know their bit, their routine, and this imagery comes to me more with Amos because it actually is, you know, in a way, like a bit. He, he's <laughs> here because he's going to keep going throughout the, um, the different nations thing for three transgressions and for four, whatever it is. And then the people around him at this time are Israelites, right? They're the, the northern kingdom of Israel. He's from Judah and he's coming up to Israel to prophesy. And so you have to imagine people in Israel going, yeah, you know, we hate those guys. Forget those guys in Damascus. Good. They're going to get killed. Good job. And then it keeps going on and on throughout. And so he's like riling them up in a little bit. He's giving them expectations of what's coming. So the first thing he's going to say is, boo, Damascus. We hate those guys. You know, they're, they're, they're terrible. Okay. That's the first thing he's going to say. And then he goes to the next one. Gaza, you know, for, for, for this area as well. Um, you want to read this one, uh, Leah? Sure. Okay. Thus said the Eternal, for three transgressions of Gaza, for four, I will not revoke it, because they exiled an entire population which they delivered to Edom. I will send down fire upon the wall of Gaza, and it shall devour its fortresses, and I will wipe out the inhabitants of Ashdod and the sceptered ruler of Ashkelon, and I will turn my hand against Akron, and the Philistines shall perish to the last man, said the eternal God. Indeed. Not, not the nicest stuff, right? But he's up right. there, he's going to talk about Gaza now, and he said, this is what they did wrong, right? They exiled the population. You know, uh, you know, they were they were not good to to, to this population. So now, right now, we're going to get divine anger and fury, and the people in Israel, are, yeah, good. We don't like those guys anyway. Good. Those that's two down. Damascus gets it, and Gaza gets it. Good times. This is what I paid to see. This is where the money goes in. Okay, they're filling up his you know guitar case with coins, right? Okay. Let's see who else is around. 
I'm back. Oh, you're back. Tony's back. Good. Back. Technical difficulties, but you're back. Tony, you want to, you want to read this over here? Thus said the Eternal. Can you see that? Sure. Thanks. Thus said the Eternal, for three transgressions of Tyre, for four I will not revoke it, because they handed over an entire population to Edom. Ignoring the covenant of brotherhood, I will send down fire upon the wall of Tyre, and it shall devour its fortresses. Okay, so again, another population, right, that's getting it. Uh, the people of Tyre, because they did this great sin, so God's going to punish them too. Fair enough. Then we get to the next one. Andy, you want to pick up there? Sure. Thus said the Eternal, for three transgressions of Edom, for I will not revoke it, because he pursued his brother with the sword and repressed all pity, because his anger raged unceasing and his fury stormed unchecked. I will send down fire upon Timon, and it shall devour the fortresses of Bozrah. Indeed it shall. Okay. So another, again, another population are Edomites. They also getting smacked around, according to God. Um, and so again, he, you've Rab been... Rabbi, is this kind of similar to Adam and, um, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, the way God is handling this? Yeah, you know, it's that same sort of imagery uh, in a way where God is going to punish those who are not doing the right thing. Right. Uh, right. And so in, in this case, you have this prophet who is basically going around the horn, like going around the different communities that surround Israel and Judah and saying, well, these people, they're going to get it. And these people, they're going to get it, you know, and he's you know, using this uh, as a, a rhetorical device in a way to get the crowd all riled up, get their juices, you know, flowing a little bit. And then he's going to drop the hammer on them too uh, when they're not realizing it. That's going to come in the end, but he's building up to that. Uh, and so he's saying, you know, the people in Damascus, they're terrible. They're, God's going to get them. People in Tyre, they're terrible. God's going to get them. Uh, and they'll be, yeah, we don't like those guys anyway. You know, it's good. It's good for them, you know. Uh, and then it just keeps on going. And eventually, it's the, 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 the circle is going to get smaller and smaller until it closes in uh, on his actual audience, who I think then will take a different tone. Uh, they'll be so happy with the prophecy after that. Rabbi, does this tie into the earthquake you were talking about at all? The earthquake is more of a, of a placeholder in terms of just you know, giving us a sense of what time this might be, because Zechariah mentions an earthquake as well. Uh, and so we think it might be the same earthquake. If, uh, if Joan Keller was here, maybe she'd be able to tell us a little more in terms of the archaeological part of this. Uh, but the idea is that there, there is evidence of some major, you know, geological event that happened during this time. Uh, and whether or not that was seen as a sign from God, I would guess that it probably was. Right, because all sort of natural disasters and all natural events at that point were seen as you know coming from God, um, and so the fact that they had this huge earthquake could be seen as a warning shot, you know, a shot that something's happening. You know, there might be some bad news uh, coming. You see this, you know, uh, you know, throughout the, the ancient Near East, and when you think about the um, development of Christianity in particular, and frankly, the development of Judaism. You know, uh, the catastrophic event was, was, was not, you know, a natural disaster. It was human-made. Uh, it was the destruction of the temple, the second mm. temple, you know, at, at that point. Uh, and that's been used as a jumping-off point for both faith and nation to get going in a different way. Really, really good question. Yeah. So whenever you have a natural disaster, a huge event, uh, just like, again, just like today, uh, you know, in, in modern times, that uh, we look for reasons and explanations or symbolism uh, in, in different events. I'm just thinking about how, how, you know, the next, you know, it's happening already, so I, I shouldn't look into the future uh, so much, but about how, you know, COVID-19 is going to be ha handled religiously uh, by people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, uh, you know, this, this great plague came down from God to punish us for whatever it might be, mm -hmm. whatever someone's mad about uh you know it's, it's going to be a plague uh, or something mm -hmm. uh, yeah i mean the fanatics are coming out of the woodwork on facebook and yeah <laughs> but it started it that already i didn't even hear that they started all of that already oh, yeah. oh yeah. of course it, it's the it's the fault of the jews did you not hear that 
Is oh, yeah. No, I didn't hear that part. I was, oh, yeah. I'm just getting, I'm just upset about the people that are picketing that want to open everything up so soon and then everybody's going to get sick again. That's what I've been listening Well, they're blaming the Jews keeping the things closed too. So, you know, either way, we're in trouble. Uh, so, you know, Manish, uh, Manish Tana. Exactly. You know, as my other prophet, uh, Chris Rock, said, you know, when these natural disasters come, that train's never late. You know, of <laughs> eventually it's coming to the Jews. Uh, you know, it's it's gonna happen. So no matter what it is, it's like clockwork. It's gonna get we're gonna get blamed for something. So and we're blamed either way. You know, we're we're, we're we're blamed on both sides of it. I mean, anti-Semitism knows no rationality, uh, and so you can get blamed for being a just capitalist Jew. Uh, you know, and I really need those bowling alleys. Say again. We really need the bowling alleys open. The Jews do. Oh yeah, yeah. The Jews, yeah. The open. <laughs> the Jews need it. And the massage parlor and the what else? Yeah, it's late night. we got to go bowl. Um, yeah, so. It's uh, Georgia. Yeah, but it's, and it's it's ways of making meaning, and some are more destructive than others, obviously, as we have learned all too well uh, throughout our history. So. The Ammonites, the next ones uh, to get to get a smack here. Uh, let me see. Who else unmuted? Uh, Linda, you around? Yep. Hi, Linda. You want to read this over here? Thus says the Eternal. Sure. Uh, thus said the Eternal for the, the for three transgressions of the Ammonites for four. I will not revoke it because they ripped open the pregnant woman of Gilead in order to enlarge their own territory. I will set fire to the wall of Rabbah and it shall devour its fortresses amid shouting on a day of battle, on a day of violent tempest. He and his officers shall go into exile together, said the Eternal. You can see the atrocities are getting more vivid. Uh, and, and more visceral, right? Uh, and so, again, the crowd's going to be very upset by hearing about this. The you know Gilead was uh, Israelite territory, right? And and so the Ammonites, who the Jews had fought against as well, uh, you know, this is you know around Jordan uh, today. Uh, you know, all this fighting is happening, uh, and so again, they're going to get what's coming to them, according to uh, Amos here. What does it mean that the Eternal says, I will not revoke it? Revoke what? Oh, uh, the punishment. Uh, so the, like the idea is that it's like three transgressions or four, meaning their sin is just so great. It's a huge, tremendous transgression that they have done. And because they have done this, the punishment's coming and it's not going to be uh, revoked. It's not going to be set aside. There's going to be no chance for uh, teshuva at this okay. point for these people. No chance of atonement. Uh, their, their sin is that great that now there's going to be uh, appropriate action taken by God. Um, okay. And so, again, you have, to, you have to picture this crowd, you know, being really excited because according to their thought, that this, you know, everyone around them is terrible. They're all horrible people. You know, you think about uh, the story of Jonah, which I love to go back to, you know, that Jonah gets told to go to Nineveh to prophesy to the Ninevians, uh, right, uh, that they're doing the wrong thing. And Jonah has no interest in going to Nineveh. He don't want to talk to these people. He doesn't like the Ninevites. You know, he doesn't care for them at all. He thinks that God should smack them around and God should, uh, you know, give them a punishment. So Jonah goes the other way. Jonah goes to Tarshish instead uh, because he's no interest in saving them. Uh, and so then his people that, you know, the Israelites and, and the people of Judah are going to be uh, against historically in a way because they've been battling them, been fighting them. Uh, for a long time, even at this point in history. And so when the crowd hears, oh, the Ammonites are going to get it, the people of Tyre are going to get it, like they're very excited. You know, they feel like, good, that's what's coming to them. It's a very popular speech. Thank so, you. you. You give the crowd what they want to hear. Uh, and then we have our friends in Moab, too, uh, you know, as well. Melissa, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, Melissa, you want to give us a read over here? That's sure. Thus said the Eternal, for three transgressions of Moab, for four I will not revoke it, because I bring the bones of the Yom to line. I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the fortresses of Ariad. And Moab shall die in tumult, and amid shouting the blare of horns. 
I will wipe out the rule from within her and slay all her officials along with him. Journal. Very nice. Our, our, our friends, the Moabites. Five points to anyone who can tell me uh, where the Moabites come from. What's their Superman origin story? Syria? Is that with Ruth? No, that, that's going to come up in a few weeks. Indeed, Ruth is a Moabite, so that's their descendants. That's, you know, when we get to Ruth, that's a very important point we're going to talk about actually in a few weeks uh, when we get to Shehuos. Uh, but where do they come from? Where do the people start? So the Israelites start from Abraham, right? You know, that, that's our ancestor all the way back. Who are the Moabites' ancestors? Who? <laughs> what? Oh, really? Yeah. Who are you here? Uh, Lot. Abraham's nephew, Lot. 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 Yeah. After the aforementioned story of Sodom and Gomorrah, right, uh, Lot's wife turns to a pillar of salt. Salt. Uh, you know, she turns back and she dies. So Lot escapes with um, his two daughters. Uh, also the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, but he, he escapes with the two daughters. So the, the daughters are, are worried that their father's line is going to stop, uh, that you know, his line is going to end there because he has no male uh, inheritors uh, at that point and his wife is gone. And so they decide to get him nice and drunk uh, and they visit him at night. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, they have children uh, by their father. Moab literally means in the Hebrew word for father, of. Abba, right? So Moab is from daddy. Mm. That's, a, that, that, that's what it's from. It's from dad. It's Moab. Um, and the other one is named something similar. I forgot what it was. But the Moabites come from that relationship from, uh, from Lot and his daughters. So this is a biblical trivia for you. Um, you can use it for trivia night next year. Um, so, <laughs> very popular. Uh, and so Moab, you know, because they did bad stuff, we have the understanding of the theme already, right? They're going to get wiped out as well. Good. Don't like them either. Moabites are done. <laughs> Next. Now we got a little problem, right? Now it's getting a little closer to home. Dan, you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. You want to give us a read over here? Thus said the Eternal. For three transgressions of Judah, for four, I will not revoke it, because they have spurned the teaching of the Eternal and have not observed God's laws. They are beguiled by delusions after which their fathers walk. I will send down fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the fortress of Jerusalem. Okay. So now we're getting a little dicey here. Now we're getting a little bit too close to home. Even though he's preaching to an Israelite audience, this couldn't necessarily have felt so good since these are, you know, their, their, uh, their neighbors, you know, and their fellow, fellow Jews, you know, down south, you know, of them. So I, I can picture him in the audience sort of squirming a little bit, you know, not necessarily loving this so much. Um, because now, again, now that circle's getting smaller and smaller, uh, and now we're attacking people that are literally, you know, their, their kin, their kindred at this point uh, in Judah. And what's the big sin, of course, as we can always guess? Uh, they have spurned God's teachings and observed God's laws, uh, idolatry, you know, beguiled by delusions, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to have fire, you know, and that's going to be a problem. That's a big problem. <coughs> okay, so... But now the main event, right? Now when everyone's good and riled up, uh, we have the next one come in. And so, thus said the Eternal, for three transgressions of Israel, for four I will not revoke it, because they have sold for silver those whose cause was just, and the needy for a pair of sandals. Ah, you who trample the heads of the poor into the dust and of the ground, and make the humble walk a twisted course. Father and son go to the same girl, and thereby profane my holy name. They recline on every altar on garments taken in pledge, and they drink in the house of their god wine they bought with fines they imposed. Ooh. 
Ooh. Not so great, Israelites, okay? That's mm -hmm. not the way to be. You see we have a number uh, of transgressions here. They have, but it begins with, as we mentioned in the opening, uh, ethics and, and, and how the, uh, the poor uh, and the needy are treated. And so here we have uh, bribery, right? And we have, um, you know, injustice in the courts that those uh, who are trying to, you know, get justice for themselves are being sold out, sold for silver. Uh, and the needy are, are you know, basically set, sold, sold down the river for a pair of sandals. Uh, and the, the heads of the poor are being trampled, uh, the humble being, you know, made to walk uh, in a difficult, you know, having difficulties thrown at them. What's a little prophecy without a little bit of sex? You know, the idea that father and son uh, are doing the wrong thing here. That's remember in Leviticus, we're not allowed to, to, to have that situation happen. We have it here. Uh, and then uh, they recline uh, by every altar on garments taken in pledge. In Leviticus, we are told that we not keep the garment of someone who is poor overnight, uh, that they might give you the garment in pledge uh, you know, as a collateral, you know, for their day's work, and you can't keep it. Uh, and the idea is here that they are keeping it, and it's this picture of luxury. Ah, you know, we're just going to go to synagogue, going to relax uh, in, in, in Joe Shimo's uh, garment, you know, instead of bringing it with them as a shamata uh, kind of thing. And then a lot of good wine, a lot of fancy pants wine being brought uh, with them and being drunk, but they were able to get that wine through unjust fines they impose upon the poor. <clears throat> you would think uh, that would be it, but you know, he's not done yet with the Israelites. Uh, he's gonna talk a little bit more about, you know, don't you remember what happened before? Uh, yet I, meaning God here, destroyed the Amorite before them, whose stature was like the cedars and who was stout as the oak, destroying his bows above and his trunk below. And I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you through the wilderness 40 years to possess the land of the Amorite. So don't you know, God says, you know, who I am and what I can do. Uh, I helped you guys out in Egypt. I, I have the power to destroy great nations. The uh, Amorites uh, are like other peoples in the Bible who for whatever reason have a reputation uh, for stature, for height. We have a uh, you know, group of uh, the Anakites uh, in, uh, in the Torah that are supposed to be giants. Uh, you have other people who just are supposed to be known as this huge. And God's saying, look, I, I, I wiped them out. You know, like I took care of them. I can take care of you just the same way if you don't shape up. Uh, and so, and then uh, again, a little bit of that Jewish mother guilt that God likes to lay on. Don't you remember what I did for you back in the day? Oh. Of Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you got the email yet? No. Oh, hi, Barbara. Okay. And so we have uh, the continuation of this. Uh, and I raised up uh, prophets from among your sons and Nazarites from among your young men. Is that not so, O oh, people of Israel, says the Eternal? The Nazarites were pretty cool. Uh, they were people who were already committed, you know, to God, as the Jewish people are supposed to be uh, committed to observe uh, the different laws and statutes that God lays out. Uh, but the Nazarites take on extra responsibilities. Does anyone remember the responsibility of the Nazarite, the extra things they have to do? I think it was Bob Mansfield's on it, too. So. Remember what the what? The Nazarites. The Nazarites are not allowed to drink wine or any uh, other grape product, uh, and they don't get their hair cut. Get the email. And so the most famous Nazarite uh, in the Bible, did you remember who he was? So, so. Delilah. So for the Nazarites, the most yeah. important thing we have is Samson. Samson oh. is a Nazarite. And oh, Samson with the hair. Out, get his hair cut or drink wine. And eventually, uh, he winds up telling his wife, Delilah, that, uh, you know, if you cut my hair, you'll sap oh, my just, strength. Uh, and then he gets his hair cut, and then uh, they're able to capture him, the Philistines. Uh, and so the Nazarites, again, are these people taking an extra vow uh, to God. Um, you know, to, to do certain things or not do certain things. 
And so you get to this next point over here that the Nazarites who are, are uh, again, particularly um, sanctified, right? Uh, they are not safe from this either. Uh, and so, um, Sandy, you, you want to grab this over here for me? Yep. But you made the Nazarites? Sure. But you made the Nazarites drink wine and ordered the prophets not to prophesy. I slow moments as a wet flowed when it is full of hot grain. Fail the swift, the strong shall find no strength, and the warrior shall not save his life. The bowman shall not hide, hold his ground, and the fleet footed shall not escape, nor the horseman save his life. Even the stout hearted warrior shall run away unarmed that day, declares the eternal. Okay, and so they've committed this sin by basically having the Nazarites betray their vows, and they've ordered the prophets not to prophesy. The prophets are being told to be quiet. They're told to put a sock in it, you know, and that's not uh, going to be helpful. God's not going to uh, really like that. Uh, and so God is going to give this imagery again of, you know, when you think about putting grain, right, putting grain onto a wagon, uh, you can picture a horse, right? You can picture uh, even like a person when you are so uh, burdened with things, right? You know, it, it slows you. It, you can't move as quickly. When you're carrying a ton of stuff on your back, you can't move quickly. And so God is going to put stuff on them metaphorically. You know, God is going to not let them escape because they're not going to be, uh, be quick or swift, right? God is going to, you know, again, slow them down enough so the bad guys can get them. Uh, so the, the, the fleet of foot there, they're not going to be able to run strong they're not going to be able to have strength uh if, if you're a bowman or a horseman whatever it might be it's not going to matter because of all these sins that have happened god's going to uh, exact justice on the behalf of the oppressed any questions so far okay it just sounds what brought on all of this anger there's just so much anger going on here uh, I would say injustice. Um, you know, Just what he saw in general. What he saw uh, and what God saw, I guess, uh, and telling Amos to talk about. Remember, Amos is not a classically trained, uh, you know, speaker, prophet, priest, poet. You know, he's uh, a nobody from nowhere. You know, you can go to Tekoa today. No one's in Tekoa. Tekoa is a small little village, right? Uh, and so he was plucked out to do this job and to go tell the people, uh, what's wrong, uh, just like the other prophets were. Uh, that was their task. And they look around and they put the idea of well, what is the response, right, to injustice? What is the response to, um, you know, to inequality and inequity? Well, what, you know, what do you say in, in the face of that? It's not going to be, for most people, a smiley, happy conversation. Uh, you know, when there's uh, perceived uh, inequality going on, there's going to be anger, there's going to be frustration, unless that is, is, uh, is mediated. Uh, if people feel they have a cause and they're going to rally behind it, it's, again, usually not the most uh, chipper of conversations. It's usually because there's serious things at stake. Uh, and so that's where the anger comes from. And I think for the prophets in particular, obviously, we're talking about now is the context here of Jewish history and Jewish law, uh, the frustrations, I mean, of, of, a, of, a, of prophets and of God basically saying, you have the law, you have the mitzvot, you, you, you know what's expected of you, what are you doing? You know, what's going on here? Why uh, do we have all this hatred, all this injustice, all this uh, oppression going on? I just gave you a Torah, you know, we were just at Sinai, not literally, because it's about a thousand years prior uh, to this. But with the idea being that, you know, we, we know what we're supposed to be doing and we're not doing it. Uh, and where a prophet like Amos, you know, comes in, he's a little bit different than some of the other prophets who are more concerned uh, with uh, rituals, though it comes in with Amos as well. But the idea being is that, uh, and this comes through in a lot of the prophets, that you can't be ritually uh, engaged in Judaism and be ethically terrible. Uh, like that does not jibe 
for the prophets. God does not, does not like hypocrisy. And so the idea of going to synagogue, or in their case, going to temple and offering sacrifices every day, but then, uh, you know, uh, taking bribes and lying and cheating and stealing and, you know, committing violence and whatever it is, uh, you can't then just go to the temple the next day and ask for forgiveness, you know, and then go back out again and do terrible things again. Uh, there's uh, an imbalance there, uh, and God does not care for that. And that's the message of the prophets uh, more than once, is that ritual piety without ethical uh, obligation, ethical uh, steadfastness is meaningless. Uh, that you might as well stay home and watch Netflix uh, if you're going to go uh, to temple and offer sacrifices, but then kick the puppy on the way out of the synagogue. Uh, you, Ra you Rabbi, so would you think that one of the major differences between Christianity and Judaism is the fact that we can't do terrible things and ask for forgiveness tomorrow, as opposed to the Christian people that as long as they accept Christ as their savior, everything is forgiven. Yeah, well, they, have to, yeah, they, they, they don't believe that. It, it depends on, yeah, it's a generalization, but there's, there's definitely, I think they have more of the deathbed confession. Uh, we have it too, obviously. Uh, but you do have some people who believe that they're saved, you know, and they can do whatever they want because they've been ordained to be saved, uh, you know, in, in certain uh, denominations of, of Protestant, um, in Protestantism, uh, whereas others, they want you to do more good works and you have to, you know, atone and mean it. If, if, if you atone and then next you do the same thing, you get nailed there too, Christianity, you know, in a lot of different denominations, Catholicism in particular. Uh, but uh, but in, in some more of the liberal Protestant denominations, have again that variance when they have people who believe that they are preordained uh, to go to heaven, and that's where that comes in. What you're talking about is the idea of those who think that God has already chosen them; they're already saved, uh, and therefore they can just do whatever they want, you know, because God has already saved them. Uh, but I think that's a smaller population, uh, you know, of Christians who actually have that particular theology. But they do have that um, that reputation. <laughs> I will say that. The reputation of, hey, do whatever you want and go, go, go to confession afterwards. Do three Hail Marys and you're good. You know, uh, but uh, I think in actual practice, it's, it's not as uh, portrayed, is my understanding. But there is some, you know, certainly hype in that direction. Uh, so I've, you know, I've, I've had friends like that. <laughs> I'm saved, I'll be fine, you know. Okay, uh, we're actually getting close to eight o'clock a little, my goodness. Um, chapter three, we're gonna move on to another prophecy. We might go a little quickly because I'd like to get to chapter five. Um, you know, this is relatively short, but I still wanna get to the next chapter. Um, Debbie, you wanna give us a read here? Hear, the, hear this word? Okay, hear this word, O people of Israel, that the eternal has spoken concerning you, concerning the whole family that I brought up from the land of Egypt. You alone have I singled out of all the families of the earth. That is why I will call you to account for your <coughs> iniquities. We could spend an hour on this paragraph alone, just because I believe this paragraph is really important in terms of Jewish self-perception in a way, and also the way we perceive rightly or wrongly the state of Israel uh, in, an, in some of the modern state of Israel, uh, that there's a standard here that God, in this case, applies to the people that, you know, there's a relationship here. There's a connection here that God has singled us out. We are the chosen people. We are Am Segula. And because we are this kingdom of priests, you know, the, the ones who have chosen to be chosen, so to speak, chosen to be part of this covenant with God, there is a higher expectation. There's an ethical standard that we are supposed to live by that may be, depending on interpretation, may be different than what other people are supposed to do. And so we have to hold ourselves, one can then continue this line of thinking, to a higher standard uh, in a way. Uh, and so because they know better, so to speak, because they were given the Torah and accepted Torah and mitzvot, because of the, their acceptance of the covenant, their going against it is much worse in a way. Their going, so being chosen in this case is actually a deficit in a way because we've already promised to do, you know, uh, the mitzvot. We've already committed 
to this life and now we're not doing it as opposed to not committing to it to begin with and doing the same actions right and and so because we have said yes because we have said not nishma, we will do and we will listen because we've accepted the covenant and now we're going away from it this is very problematic because now it's it, it's a it's another you know it's it's almost a betrayal you know in some way that we have are not living up to god's expectations of us okay leah you want to pick up over here can two walk sure can two walk together without having met does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey does a great beast let out a cry from its den without having made a capture does a bird drop on the ground in a trap with no snare there does a trap spring up from the ground unless it has caught something when a ram's horn is sounded in a town do the people not take alarm can misfortune come to a town if the eternal has not caused it Indeed, my eternal God does nothing without having revealed God's purpose, God's servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, but who can fear? My eternal God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Okay. It almost sounds like it's a riddle, you know, uh, what's the sound of one hand clapping, uh, you know, for all this stuff over here. But the idea being, and I'll, I'm going to focus on the ram's horn, you know, the shofar, the idea that when you hear the alarm, you know trouble's coming. And Amos is comparing himself almost in a way to that alarm. I'm here. I'm telling you what's going to happen. You know, there's, you know, all these warning signs that are there. Pay attention. Because if you don't pay attention, you don't get with the program, bad stuff's going to happen. Uh, and so God is, is here. God is listening. God is watching. God is seeing all this that's going uh, 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 wrong. And uh, alarm is being sounded. Okay, time to take notice. Uh, the lion has roared, who can but fear, uh, and uh, who can uh, you know, but prophesy, which is, I think, uh, maybe another, just as a side note, this sentence, I think, is really great, because it talks about an obligation, right, an ethical obligation and a moral obligation uh, to do the right thing, that when God tells you what to do, you know, that's what you got to do, and so God ha has, God is using Amos uh, as, you know, a messenger, <laughs> that God has talked to him, but now God has told him what he has to do. He can't go back playing video games, right? You know, like Amos has a job to do now. Amos has a very serious job to do, and he can't just ignore it. Uh, God has called upon him to do this job. He's got to go do it. And I think that it gets drawn out to the idea that when you see, when, when one sees injustice, when one sees inequality, when one sees societal ills, you know, that are happening, that it's a responsibility to say something. You know, God has told us what we need to be doing. Who can but prophesy? Who can, who can hold it back? You know, what is what he's trying to say. That that's the job to go out and, and do something and advocate for the good. Because if not, the bad stuff's going to happen. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so, you, you, you have, so this actually is on a similar idea. So proclaiming the fortresses of Ashdod and the fortresses of the land of Egypt, Say, gather on the hill of Samaria and witness the great outrages within her and the oppression in her midst. They are incapable of doing right, declares the Eternal. They store up lawless, lawlessness and robbery in their fortresses. Assuredly, thus says um, my Eternal God, an enemy all about the land. He shall strip you of your splendor and your fortresses shall be plundered. So it's just an idea that they're so far gone at this point. They're incapable of doing right. They can't figure it out. There's too many, too much bad stuff going on. And because of that, an enemy is going to come to get them. The enemy, of course, being the Assyrians, who are going to come in about 40 years uh, from uh, the time of Amos' death. And the Assyrians are going to come. They're going to wipe out the northern kingdom of Israel uh, about 701 BCE. And they're going to uh, disperse, I'm sorry, 722. 722 BCE, uh, and they're going to disperse the people and send the 10 tribes into exile. Uh, so yeah, about 20 years or so after he died. But all's not going to be lost. Thus says the Eternal, as a shepherd rescues from the lion's jaws two shank bones, good for Passover, two shank bones or the tip of an ear, so shall the Israelites escape who dwell in Samaria 
And so they're going to escape, but not, not a lot of them. You know, parts of them are going to survive. And they'll have a little bit with them, a leg of a bed, head of a couch. They'll have something they'll bring with them, right? Something that they'll be able to rescue. Uh, again, not the best imagery here, obviously, not the most uh, positive, but better than nothing, right? To be able to have something remaining uh, because God promises never to destroy the people completely. Okay. That's why I plow ahead a little bit just to get the chapter five. Over here. Jan, you want to pick up over here? All right. Hear this word which I intone as a dirge over you, O house of Israel. Fallen, not to rise again. Maiden, he's abandoned on her soil with none to lift her up. For thus said my eternal about the house of Israel the town that marches out of a thousand strong shall have a lunch hundred left. And the one who that marches on out a hundred shall strong shall have but ten left. Okay, so literal decimation, right? Uh, where there's going to be a tenth left over, uh, and so you have a thousand uh, that's going to turn to a hundred, and a hundred's going to turn into ten, uh, and so there's going to be that uh, again that literal decimation uh, where you're going to have only a tenth remaining. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Uh, okay, so let's skip here. We have uh, I think that already. Okay. And Tony, you want to go over here? Who made the Pleiades? Sure. Who made the Pleiades and Orion? And who turns deep darkness into dawn and darkens day into night? Who summons the waters of the sea and pours them out, out upon the earth? His name is the Eternal. It is God who hurls destruction upon strongholds so that ruin comes upon fortress. Okay, and so this is going to be a big theme of the prophets that even when bad stuff happens, it's going to be God's hand, uh, you know, and that's, we've talked about that theology before being very troubling and sort of, you know, sort of destructive in a way uh, for the Israelites, uh, but it was their way of making meaning. The idea that, uh, you know, God, is going to either be protecting the people or God is going to allow uh, bad stuff to happen. But everything goes through, uh, you know, will of God, you know, God's power. And then later Jewish uh, theologians and rabbis and philosophers are going to have to try to interpret this a little bit differently uh, for our humanity. Uh, because again, this theology can get a little bit uh, masochistic and a little bit destructive and it leads to some dark places. But for them, it helped them make some meaning that um, you know that everything sort of comes from uh, from God, and so God is able to protect and God is able to punish. We don't really do much of the punishing God nowadays, thank goodness. Okay, now so what did they do uh, to uh, earn them such a rebuke? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Carolyn, you want to pick up over here? They hate the arbiter. Carolyn, you there? Hmm. No, I don't have it right now. Okay. They hate the arbiter in the gate and detest him whose plea is just. Assuredly, because you impose a tax on the poor and exact from him a levy of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted delightful vineyards that shall not drink their wine. For I have noted how many are your crimes and how countless are your sins. You enemies of the righteous, you take care of bribes. You subvert in the gate of the cause of the needy. Assuredly, at such a time, the prudent man keeps silence for it is an evil time. Uh, with the idea being that uh, the silence part is a little weird. But the idea is it's supposed to be silence in the face of the rebuke. That you can't answer such charges. These things are so terrible they're doing, uh, someone who's rational can't go, well, yeah, but, you know, yeah, but it's okay. You know, like that there are, 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 are good things that are happening too. There's no uh, whitewashing this. There, there's no saying that, you know, there's an excuse. You can't uh, find any excuse for this kind of, uh, of behavior, according to the prophet. There's no uh, rationalization for it. Uh, we're always... Um, called upon to do good. So seek good and not evil that you may live. 
uh, you know, hate evil and love good, establish justice in the gate. And then if that happens, perhaps there's going to be good times in the future of being gracious to the remnant of Joseph. And so let's, let's get to the end. This is actually one of my favorite passages in Amos. Uh, ah, you who wish for the day of the eternal. You mentioned the idea of the day of God, right? Those of you who wish for the day of the eternal. Why should you want the day of the eternal? It's going to be darkness, not light. Okay, so everyone's going to be seeking this really great day, you know, where God's going to come and it's going to be happy, clappy, and everyone's going to be thrilled. And he's saying, no, it's going to be darkness. Uh, and then he puts a little bit of prophetic humor in here. As if a man should run, they should run from a lion, but get attacked by a bear. Or if he escaped the bear and he got indoors, he should lean his hand on the wall and be bitten by a snake. Okay, so there's no escape trying to say is that you think you might not be able to outrun it, it's not going to happen. So the day of the eternal shall be not light, but darkness, blackest light with a glimmer. Without a glimmer, I'm sorry, without a glimmer. Uh, it gets a little bit rough here, uh, but it ends with a very famous passage, which is what I was trying to get to to, to, to close this out here. Uh, this goes to the idea of the uh, problem with ritual piety. Uh, with uh, the lack of ethical concern. Uh, and so th these are the words of God here. I loathe, I spurn your festivals. I am not appeased by your solemn offerings or assemblies. If you offer me burnt offerings or your meal offerings, I will not accept them. I will pay no heed to your gift of fatlings. Spare me the sound of your hymns and let me not hear the music of your lutes, but let justice well up like water righteousness like an unfailing stream. Uh, and so that passage, this last uh, verse from Amos is oft quoted, uh, and that's why I wanted to show you that's where it comes from. Uh, the idea that all this other stuff is happening, it's not good. What does God uh, desire? God desires justice. God desires us to do right uh, and, and to, um, you know, try to shun and spurn inequality uh, and try to you know, get rid of wrongdoing and oppression. Uh, everything else, you know, in comparison doesn't matter to the prophets. They don't want to hear about, you know, again, how often someone goes to synagogue or, uh, you know, or any of that. They want to make sure that we are doing right uh, by each other. Uh, and so I think that's really a great note to end on I, you know, of the, the committed pursuit uh, of justice and of right. It's really a great message for today uh, and every day, honestly, that we should always be uh, seeking out and searching how we can do good in the world. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. A pleasure. We're going to take a, a, a 90 second uh, intermission and then we're going to continue with Derech Torah. We're going to continue with uh, our study very of Avot, uh, some rabbinic literature coming up next. Uh, and so we can sort of stretch a little bit. Yes. Uh, and, and those who, who uh, I mean, hope all of you stay on, but you know, we're going to be starting in just a, a moment or two. We can just take this moment if we want to check in with everyone. People want to say hi to each other. Now's a good time to do that. I'm going to say hi to Eric. Eric, how you doing? You're doing good. How are you doing? Good. That, nice to see you. the background that you put on your... Uh... Yeah, I got the temple background up. Well, I thought. That's, yeah. yeah. Is either that or a corned beef sandwich? <laughs> Looks good. Thank you. But I can't drink in the temple, so you know. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. It seems that in the Bible, Torah, these part, that God speaks to the people, the Israelites. Yeah. And 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 they and, and you're assuming that they hear God. And they will or they may or may not they may or may not accept what God says. Now all of us here today do we do we ever hear God about what our society or our, ourselves are doing right or wrong? And do we are we able to speak back? As, it seems to be very liberal uh, and literal in the Bible, but you know a lot of us have trouble dealing with that phenomenon. Yeah, I would say that according to Jewish tradition, the idea of um, ecstatic prophecy, or the idea of of um, people who literally hear from God uh, in, in visions or in dreams, that is supposed to have stopped 
uh, with the destruction of the temple. So we can no longer access God in that way. Uh, and so God is accessed to us through prayer and through study. Uh, and uh, there's a, an old joke somewhere that it's like, you're religious if you talk to God, you're crazy if God talks back. Uh, and so I, I think that there's a question of what does it mean to hear the voice of God in the 21st century, right? What does that mean? Because if you had somebody like Amos today, he'd probably be put into Bellevue. You know what I'm saying? Like, like he's just not someone who you would be listened to in the same way. Uh, because we don't have that same understanding of people who literally are the megaphone. You know, they're the mouthpiece for God. And so it's, it's a little bit dissonant on that level. But the idea is that we have the Torah. You know, we have the Torah, we have the Bible. Uh, and according to a traditional view, obviously, you know, uh, a traditional view of this is that that would be God's, you know, words and right, God's voice telling us what to do. Uh, and so we have in a way, we have the blueprint, and uh, rabbinic literature then uh, purports to flesh out the blueprint and really sort of build what does it mean to have a Jewish life. But even back then, and of course today, there's going to be variation uh, on what we think it means to live a Jewish life, uh, not only uh, with denominationalism, but um, within denominations, different views of what it means to live a Jewish life. And what does it mean to hear God's voice? Uh, and, and, and then enact it in our lives. I think we're usually a little bit wary when somebody says, I did this because, I, you know, I believe this is what God is, you know, wants of me or that this is what God wants of somebody else. You know, we, that, that sometimes that comes off a little, little off. Again, especially more for others. I believe God wants us all to do this, you know, whatever this might be. I think we like to have our own our own sense of it. You coming back in here? I promise that should be. Well, I, I think that was a good example of you once hand you when we had this class once you asked us what our interpretation of God was, what did God yeah. what do we think God is. Now here we saw a different side of God where he is angry, we want and gets revenge for people that have it's it was very interesting how you could hear what people think of God and then God, how God reacts to certain things that he's not all loving and he can be revengeful if he has to be. And it's very interesting. It can be a bit of a challenge. I and mean, we the, the theological challenge of having an emotional God, you know, uh, because if God can be happy and God can be loving and God can be kind and God can be compassionate, can God be other things that are less pleasant too? Uh, and that, that's a question, you know, we have to ask ourselves is do we believe in a God who acts that way? Or do we believe that all emotion of a, of a deity is metaphor? You know, that God doesn't get angry or sad or mad or, or, or happy or, or whatever it might be, and that God is unchanging. You know, the e eternality of God might you know lend itself to believe that God is if God is unchanging, God cannot experience emotions. Because experiencing emotions would be a change, because if you go from happy to sad, that's a change. Uh, and so, if God is is infinite and not changing, it's harder to have a God with emotions. Um, so, with the idea of having a listening God uh, versus having a listening and acting God, you know, a God who hears our prayers but a God who doesn't act in the world in the same way anymore. I'm thinking that earlier, as Tony said about Catholics or Christian yeah. um, believing in Jesus and they're saved. And earlier, I, what I thought of it, what all went when and gone is another, another reason why we have Yom Kippur. Yeah. To, uh, to think of all the things we may not have done well and hopefully do things better the next year. Yeah, and there's a clarity, you know, in, in Yom Kippur uh, and in its um, in Jewish understandings of atonement is that the idea is that you, you can commit a transgression and you can apologize for it on Yom Kippur, but you're not supposed to then commit the same transgression the next day. Uh, that, that, that God doesn't, doesn't work that way according to classical theology, understandings of, uh, of teshuva means that you can't just do the same thing over and over again and keep asking for forgiveness. The idea is that you, you do the wrong thing, 
you apologize and you don't do it again. <laughs> you know, it's like what, what I tell my kids sometimes, you know, similar idea, right? Is that, you know, the idea is, you know, to beat up your, 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 your brother, right? And then ask for forgiveness. Well, don't beat him up in the first place. You know, stop. You have to stop doing that, that action. Uh, eventually. So, that, so that's the definition of insanity, isn't it? Doing yeah, the same thing over and over again? Yeah, exactly. It's like a different result, right? Uh, right. So, also, the, uh, yeah. the, the process of confession is sort of cathartic, and maybe the person will be blessed in, with, for volunteering his or her misgivings. Um, and so oh, yeah. They can be absolved after that confession. But when they see a psychiatrist who asks, who listens at the same thing, they're not absolved from it. No, they're not. But there's uh, obviously a tremendous amount of psychology uh, that, that goes with prayer, you know, uh, as well. So even, even if you're someone who does not believe, you know, in a, in a personal God in the same way, uh, there is, uh, I think, a psychic benefit, obviously, to the idea of, of, of prayer and, and, and confession. That if you confess something, you know, it's that idea of the weight being lifted off your shoulders. Uh, there's a rabbi, a rabbinic teacher, I'm to remember who he's from, but the idea is that, you know, when we rise from our prayers, uh, if we are not changed by them, you know, then our prayer was not uh, as effective. The idea is that when we're supposed to pray, and then once we finish, that we're supposed to arise better people or more motivated, more compelled to, you know, to do good, uh, maybe feel a little bit freer, whatever it is. But if we're just standing there, so the same thing we do every week and there's no emotional impact on us, uh, then, you know, is that prayer a true prayer uh, or not? And so I think the benefit of, the, of confession, so to speak, in the Catholic circles, but the benefit of just, you know, Yom Kippur or other moments of, of teshuva that hopefully it does make us into better people. It, it does, you know, you take us to a, a better place and take weight off our shoulder and make us, you know, sort of feel better about the situation. And hopefully uh, if it's with, you know, an issue with somebody else, that it repairs a relationship, you know, obviously. Like that, that, that's the goal, to repair that relationship. Okay, we're going to dive into our next thing here. Pirke Avot. Uh, we started this journey last week. Pirkei Avot, uh, the literal translation is usually rendered ethics of the fathers, uh, or ethics of the ancestors. Um, it, it can also be defined as uh, chapters of ethics themselves, chapters of first principles, different um, par no, well, not really parables, different proverbs, different sayings, different aphorisms that try to teach us how to live a, a, a better life. Uh, we're supposed to, during the time between uh -huh. Passover and Shavuot, it's 49 days. Uh, every week, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to be studying a different chapter of Pirkei Avot. Uh, because there's seven chapters in all, seven times seven, 49. It takes us right up to Shavuot, uh, where we receive the Torah. The idea is that during uh, this time, for us, you know, for, uh, as Jews, that we're supposed to be trying to uh, spiritually purify ourselves. Uh -huh in some way, like the Israelites did on their way from uh, Egypt to Sinai, we ourselves are taking that metaphorical journey from Egypt to Sinai, and we're supposed to be thinking about how we can be better, how we can do better, uh, and Pirkei Avot, the study of, is supposed to help us uh, in, that, uh, in that effort. And so we're going to study uh, a few different uh, pieces of this. As I mentioned last week, uh, Pirkei Avot is oft quoted. Uh, by rabbis and by Jewish, uh, you know, by, by Jewish professionals, uh, because it has so many uh, really great nuggets in there. We're not going to study. Uh, uh, we'll say some of them a little bit more out of the box uh, today, because that's fun too. Uh, but maybe you'll recognize one or two of these as well. Uh, so we're going to go back to our screen share. It's work, and it does. Okay, and so we're going to start with chapter two. Uh, verse one, since we did chapter one last week, or you know, chapter two, Peric one, really the first part of it. Um, Jan, you want to pick that up over here? Rabbi Yehuda Hanazi said, Which is the straight path that a person should choose for himself? Whichever that is praiseworthy for the person adopting and earns praise from people. And be as careful with like commandment 
as with a weighty one. For you do not know the reward given for fulfillment of the commandments. Also weigh the loss that may be sustained through fulfillment of a commandment against the reward that may be obtained for it. And gain that may be obtained through uh, committing as a transgression against the left, the loss, the loss that may be sustained by committing it. Keep your eye on three things. You will not come to sin. You know that what is above you, an eye that sees, and an ear that hears, is all your book. Thank you. So yeah, this is a little tricky, uh, you know, because um, you can see I, I filled in the you know the brackets uh, are the ones that try to make it easier. I'm not sure if it always makes it easier, <laughs> but I try to fill in some of it uh, so we can follow along. So. Uh, we'll break it down into different pieces. So Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, uh, Judah uh, the Prince, this is the person who collates, who redacts, who edits the Mishnah itself, the oral Torah. Uh, and so he's a very important uh, rabbi and scholar of that time and in Jewish history. And so he asks the question, what's the best way to live, right? How, we should, how should we live our lives? And so he says, basically, think about your actions and whatever you do, you know, you have to think about two things. Uh, are you gaining praise or benefit you know, from your action? And are other people, you know, thinking that what you're doing is right? And so it's about self, you know, uh, motivation, uh, right? It's about, you know, are you doing what makes you happy, what feels good to you? And are, you, are those same actions good, you know, in the eyes of others? So that, that's what he's talking about here, is that the right path is probably a combination of those things, that if both of those things are true, it's probably okay. You're probably doing okay uh, in, in your life, uh, that you are happy, and you, know, you, you are gaining kind of, not a material benefit per se, but you're getting good about what you're doing, and other people are also thinking what you're doing is good, that you need uh, both. So that was the first part. Then he mentions about the commandment, Light commandments versus weighty commandments. One would argue there's no such thing as a light commandment or a weighty commandment. Uh, which is actually the greater point here is that we don't know which commandments are quote unquote more important, right? There are just commandments in the traditional Jewish uh, experience that the commandments are there, 613 of them, right? And you have to do them all because we might think ourselves that one is more important than the other, but that's not necessarily going to be true because we don't have, you know, that that vision, that understanding uh, that God, who gave us these commandments, has. So we don't know. So we got to be careful with both uh, ones that we think might be light, so to speak, and those that might be weighty. So let me just give you an example, right? Of we would all agree, I would hope that the Ten Commandments says, you know, you shall not murder. That's a pretty heavy commandment. We all have that understanding that murdering somebody is wrong and that we shouldn't uh, do that. Now, there might be another commandment that I'm going to just pick a random ethical, I mean, uh, a, a random ritual mitzvot uh, about uh, lulav and etrog, right? It might not matter to us during Sukkot if we're waving a lulav and etrog uh, after, uh, you know, Yom Kippur uh, during this festival of Sukkot, we might not care. What what good is it, right, to, to, to wave the lulav around? Who cares about that? Uh, and so we say, eh, don't bother. We, we don't have to do it. Uh, someone else will do it. It's fine. Uh, and they're saying, well, don't do that because murdering someone, while we know is going to be bad, it might be uh, you know just as much of a problem in God's eyes for you not to do. Can you help me for a minute. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, and so that's what we have. Thing that I have no idea. How do you get it off? Just turn it off. Uh, it's, 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 you mentioned murder, and I think yeah. that's important because some of the scripture says kill in the Ten yeah. Commandments. And from what I know, the rabbi said that you may have to kill someone in defense of yourself and your family and your country. But yeah. Murder means that you are planning to do it ahead of time for whatever reason. Yes. 
that there is a there is a, a a very clear difference in the Bible for killing and murder. Uh, and murder is a much harsher term, also. Yes, the much harsher term. It has the the feeling of uh, of obviously uh, immorality and malfeasance to it that you're killing someone, you know, for some gain or for whatever reason, you know, that you're doing it out of anger, out of whatever, as opposed to a sense of, as Jan was saying, uh, of uh, self-preservation or, you know, military campaign, whatever it might be, where there's going to be death in those uh, scenarios, perhaps. That's not the same as killing someone because they took your sheep, you know, uh, and then you're going to go and kill them, okay? So that's very different. And of course, the Bible was very progressive uh, for its time, about delineating between uh, you know murder and manslaughter, you know, accidental death uh, as a text, uh, where there's different rules about accidental death uh, in the Torah. Uh, then it's that's not all again one one rule, right? Then they make distinctions there. Um, and so with Pirkei Avot, they talk about the ideas that you think about: well, what do you gain from doing something right versus what do you lose from doing what is right? What do you gain by doing something wrong? Versus what do you lose by doing something wrong? And you have to sort of balance that out in your head as well as we're all this whole thing about weight and, and gain and, and fulfilling and blah, blah, blah. That's in the easiest way. It's you think about, you do a cost benefit analysis for actions, right? If you do X, what's the consequence? What's Y? What does that look like for you, uh, for us all, right? So that was that whole chunk. It could have been a, a lot shorter, but the rabbis are always loquacious. Uh, and then think about, uh, three things, right, that, that are very important. We sometimes read this passage during uh, the high holy days, the high holidays, uh, that uh, you're supposed to always remember uh, that there is an eye, right? There's an all-seeing eye. That, you know, God is, is, is watching uh, us. God is listening to us. And that there is a Sefer Chaim, right, that all of our deeds are written in a book. Very, again, classical, very old school, uh, this idea that uh, it's almost a Santa Claus depiction of God, you know, that God is always watching. God knows when you're sleeping. God knows when you're uh, awake. Uh, so Do you that Santa Claus? Yeah, I'm saying the, the, the Santa Claus version of God, uh, where, where God's always watching. God's always going to, you know, if you do something bad, then you get the divine vets, right? Uh, the clap on the cough, as we used to say back in the day. So... We have, uh, you know, that imagery here of, of a punishing God. So what God is, going to, uh, what, uh, or, or better, better said than punishing, God is, is judging, right? God is, is keeping account, keeping records. And if you think about, I'm uh, thinking about the Warner Brothers cartoons and whatnot, when they have the angel and the devil on the shoulders, you know, that pop up. Uh, and the idea is if you listen to that angel voice, you know, you won't be... Uh, doing the wrong thing, according to this, according to this. that you have to think about uh, again, the consequence and just know that there are consequences, that there are, you know, things that we, um, that there are things that happen to us, you know, depending on our actions, uh, whether think, natural consequences. Earlier, that talks about doing something and seeking a reward in a yeah. relation. And I remember, you know, the different types of giving Mm. And, and the turn, I guess the last one, which is the, I guess the truest one, is that you give anonymous, anonymously and the person receiving you see me? doesn't know who gets it. Yeah, that's, that's one of the higher levels, right? Where it, it, it's, it's double blind, where there is, uh, you know, you, you don't it anonymously and the person who gets it doesn't know who, who, who gave it, right? Uh, and so that's seen as a very high level of, uh, of sadaka. Right, uh, and that it's this idea that we should not be doing good for the, uh, the seeking of a reward, right? Uh, the, the condition of a reward. So, our friend Bart Nura of Adi Ben Avraham. Bart Nura of Adi Ben Avraham, 15th century. Uh, he is going to come in with his commentary uh, on this verse. Okay. Karen, you want to give that a read? Sure. Um, which is the right path that a person should choose? Whichever path that is itself praiseworthy, praiseworthy for the person adopting it. 
that it should be pleasant and pleasant to people from him, from him. And this will be when one walks in the middle path in all of these character traits and not veer to one of the two extremes. For if one is very stingy, one benefits by gathering much money together, but people do not praise this person for this trait. And if one throws money around beyond what is fitting, the people that receive it benefit and are laudatory, but it is not beneficial for the individual and it is not pleasant as this person will come to poverty because of it, but rather the trait of generosity, which is the middle trait between stinginess and throwing money around, is praiseworthy as one keeps their money and does not throw it around more than is fitting. <laughs> and it is praiseworthy for others from such a person as people give praise that this person gives as is fitting to give. And so is the case with all of the other traits. There you go, well read. <laughs> I think it's rich. Rab Rabbi, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, my, mother, my mother's mantra was always everything in moderation. Wow. Mm. That's great. No dreams. We, uh, we studied a little earlier in the year a little bit about Maimonides. Uh, and, and this is really Maimonides' uh, theology in a way, that he loved what he called derech ha'emtza, uh, which means the middle path, right? And it's that he viewed extremes uh, as, um, as very difficult uh, and, and very tough. Uh, he just he wasn't a fan, and so partner here is even the same idea that let's say you're somebody who is blessed with a certain amount of capital, a certain amount of mo of money. If you're stingy, you know, if you if you don't give, well, it's good for you, right? Personally, you, know, you get more money, it's fine, you know. But no one's gonna be like, oh, that's great, this miser over here has all the money and is not sharing it, so it's not laudable. Then uh, on the flip side of it, you might have somebody who gives all their money away. And Judaism doesn't like that either. You know, like Judaism believes that there's actually a limit, there's a cap to tzedakah, uh, that you cannot uh, give tzedakah to the point where you yourself become impoverished. Because if you become impoverished, then what do you need? Tzedakah. So all you're doing is you're, just, you're, you're continuing the circle, right, in, in the wrong way, that you can't just diminish yourself to the point where you have nothing. Other people might be thrilled, right, that you're giving all your money away and throwing it out left and right to everybody who comes knocking, but then you're poor, and then you have no money, and that's a problem for you. So that doesn't work out well either. So you have to find that middle path where you want to be generous, right, uh, if you are, are, are fortunate to have, you know, uh, have the means, uh, but there are limits. Yesh kabul, as we say, there are limits to everything, right? And, and so you find that middle path. You do sadaka, you give. Ra Rabbi, my father, may he, may he rest in peace, always used to say, it's an old Yiddish proverb, that everything with a C, which means with too much, is no good. Yeah, everything with too much, you're exactly right. You know, too much of anything, right? Too much of everything can be a problem. Uh, and so excess is going to be something that the rabbis are going to look at. Remember, uh, as I, I, I am uh, often want to say, that Judaism as a religious tradition dating back, you know, 2,000 years or more of Judaism, we are one of the only faith traditions that I can think of that never developed a real monastery, really, you know, uh, ascetic kind of tradition where we don't say to people, give up all your possessions and move to the mountains of Tibet and live a life of just, you know, a humble poverty and poverty. We don't say that in Judaism. It's okay to make money in Judaism. Judaism lauds professionalism, being able to go out and make your way in the world. But what they don't want you to do is to hoard all the money for yourself. You can make the money, but you can also give uh, you know, as well. Judaism view money as bad. Judaism view money as a blessing. Uh, and then there's a mitzvah to then give. Uh, you know, attached to it, but again, not to the point where you impoverish yourself. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's very, to me, that's always been a forward thinking uh, idea is that money in and of itself is not a sin. The current uh, situation, more invested in, in Bill Gates, they give go away, I guess, all the money they're made in their foundation, and they don't say if they've given to their family or if they have enough to sustain, but. They're, they're, they're being lauded, lauded because they're giving away the trillions of dollars that they've made for, you know, 
the Kunal Lu. It's Kunal Lu, you know, they're giving. You know, it's like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, you know, they aren't suffering. You know, like, like they, they'll do okay, but they're giving away, you know, a good amount of their fortune, right? They're giving away uh, to different charitable causes. But uh, yeah, I don't think they're gonna. They're gonna not gonna hold the telethon for Bill Gates. He'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> and Warren Buffett. They'll be fine. Um, let's see here. Rabenu Yona, our, our friend uh, Yona Grundy, 13th century Spain. Um, here, oh, we'll give it a read while we're here. Leah, you want to give that a read and weigh the gain? Sure. And weigh the gain that may be obtained through the committing of a transgression against the loss that may be sustained by committing it. Lest there be in your heart the base thought to say, there is great reward in doing this sin and I will gain very much with it and I will have great pleasure and how can I not do it? Guard yourself and consider that which you will lose from it in the end of days it is, as it is many times over that which you have gained now. And the future pain is and the future pain is much longer and bigger than the temporary pleasure. And when you put this into your heart, your hand will cease from doing it, as a person does not want to gain that has a greater loss attached to it. Okay, so again, so logical thinking. Um, one can argue, you know, what keeps us civilized, you know, what keeps us doing the right thing. Is, is, you know, that we don't think to ourselves maybe this way, that, hey, you know, tomorrow I can go rob a bank and I'll have more money, you know, uh, and sure, why not? You know, uh, with that money, I'll have great pleasure. Sure, why not? But you realize that there's probably a problem there. You know, it's not going to work out so well for us uh, and that we will sort of have a problem if we try to commit crimes uh, and live our lives that way, uh, that we have to sort of weigh the, the, the outcomes. Uh, and certainly, you know, uh, you know, one can argue about whether that works for people, but the idea that, you know, crim criminality is what I'm thinking about, about how criminals often say, hey, you know, what do I have to lose? I'll, I'll, I'll do it and I'll see if I can get away with it. And if they do, you know, then uh, it works out, I guess. But then eventually, hopefully, uh, you have to pay the piper and it catches up to you. Uh, and so this idea that the future pain is going to be uh, worse than the temporary pleasure, right? No matter what we do. Have to weigh those consequences. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind as they were reading this is not even so much as a sin, but all these people who are going to the beach now with the temporary pleasure and not knowing what's going to happen. Mm, Very terrible. One can certainly read some COVID into this. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, this idea about the, the communal, the communal wheel. Uh, and what we owe each other, you know, as uh, as individuals and as a community right now, uh, and that sure, you know, it might feel really good to you know, disobey some of the social distancing uh, guidelines right now, uh, but maybe uh, the long term won't be so great. Yes, you know, and the saying that th there is great reward in doing this sin. Well, the person who feels that whatever they're doing has great reward may not really may not think that that's sinful yeah well they can justify it to themselves in some way I think that's where it comes in you may be able to rationalize it you know i think you're thinking here of more sort of like i mean about the the, the more black and white right and wrong you know that, you, that i think one can think to themselves you know, there's a right thing and a wrong thing, but this wrong thing is really tempting right now. And uh, maybe I can justify it to myself, even though it's wrong, I can sort of, you know, finagle it enough in my head to say, oh, why not? You know, I I I'll do it. And I'm not saying for really big things, but for small things, and just sort of maybe doing something. But uh, in those moments that give us, as it says, a temporary pleasure and, and more pain in the future. But you're right, might be able to rationalize to themselves and say, hey, it's not a, it's not a problem. You know, in, in, in my unique circumstance, it's okay if I do X. Now, of course, this is not including some uh, more, again, ethically gray areas. I think this is more thinking about a more black and white world uh, of, of right and wrong and less ambiguity. But there's always the fear of getting caught on the other side. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I would think so. Yeah, a fear of getting caught. Uh, and the, the, the knowledge that whatever you're doing, if it's illicit or uh, illegal, that there's going to be a penalty to be, to be paid. 
you know, uh, and, and that hopefully keeps people on the straight and narrow if they aren't internally compelled to do so, that there should be an external motivation not to perhaps uh, engage in a life of crime, I would hope. But sometimes maybe not. Uh, here we go. Um, this is, a, I think, an interesting one. Though sometimes the language gets a little tricky here, but we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, Linda, you want to give us a read over here? Okay. Uh, he, Robin, Gamil, Gamil. the son of Rabbi Judah Anasi, mm -hmm. was accustomed to say, make God's will like your will, so that God will make your will like God's will nullify your will to God's will, so that God will nullify the will of others to your will. Hillel says, do not separate yourself from the community. Do not believe in yourself until the day of your death. Do not judge your fellow until you come to their place. Do not say something that cannot be heard, for in the end, it will be heard. Do not say, when I will be available, I will study Torah with you never become available. Thank you very much. We're not going to worry about that first part so much. Uh, we're going to sort of start with the Hillel section of uh, do not separate yourself from the community uh, as, an, uh, as an important uh, trait, an important value, uh, along with some of these other ones. Uh, as we continue, uh, some of these might sound familiar, right? Because they've been said in different ways. You know, do not judge your fellow until you come to their place. You know, well, walking a mile in their shoes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, do not say, uh, I don't have time, I'll, I'll, I'll study Torah, because you know what? You might not have time, ever. You always find another reason not to do it. Uh, and so these are pretty, I think, more common uh, ideas. Uh, and so let's look at what, what Hillel first, about al tifrosh min hatzibur, do not separate yourself from the community. Let's take a look at what that means. Uh, Gary, you want to give that a read? Are you there? I'm sorry. Uh, what? Beginning with Rabbanu Yonah? Yeah, right below the Hillel, right? Okay. Hillel says, <clears throat> Hillel says, do not separate yourself from the community. At the time when the community is involved with Torah study and with the commandments, it is the crown of all the worlds and uh, the glory of all of God's domain. And this is with a community that does that goes in the good path and gathers to do a commandment. But it is not fitting to attach oneself to a community that leans to the bad path and the deeds of which are corrupted. And one who separates from them, behold, this person is praiseworthy. Okay, very good. So Hillel says, don't separate yourself from the community. So what does this mean we have? synagogues okay because that's the whole point is that we're going to create community sure we can pray at home right we can you know say uh the shema and some other prayers at home we can do other mitzvot at home but that's not the point the point is we should be together uh and doing these things coming together to do jewish uh and it's a very praiseworthy trait to say it's you know we're going to go be together with uh, other jewish people uh, to study Torah, to, to learn, uh, to pray, to do good works, uh, that this is the crown of all worlds, right? This is the best thing you could even do, is understand that, it's, that, that the community uh, and the, um, the participation and engagement with the community is essential for Jewish living. Uh, and, and then, of course, he has this little caveat here about it's only true if the community is actually a good community. If you can abandon the community that's the den of thieves, you can, you know, abandon being part of a gang that's doing wrong things. That's okay. You can get rid of that community. But a community that's doing good, you should be connected to it. Uh, and, and you should all do good works together, right? So it's a really important uh, idea from Hillel. Uh, I'll get oft quoted the idea that we are meant to be together, meant to be part of community uh, in, in Jewish tradition. I think also what in the beginning what I it came to me was that you're not alone in the world. We are not alone in the world. And if you think you're alone, then you know you're not involved and you're not sensitive or uh, to the community of the world around you. 
Indeed, exactly right. Uh, well, and, and, if, and if that is it, then that many times is your own fault. Which part? The, the, the feeling isolated? Right. If you're not part of the community, many times it's your own fault. It's a choice. Yeah, it, exactly. yeah it, it's a choice that's made from some people that like they don't want to engage and then they worry right. about, you know, why aren't they engaged? You know, it's, you know, it's, it's often very self-fulfilling, I think, is maybe, is maybe trying to say, you know, uh, as, as well, right? That you have to want it. You know, like, like Judaism is not a spectator sport. Uh, you know, that, that for us, we're meant to be involved and to, and to be engaged. And I hear people say all the time, well, I'm not you know, involved in, in, in whatever it might be. But they're not making any effort to be engaged with it. You know, uh, and it makes it very hard. It makes it again. I agree with that part of it. But it is often, you know, an issue of just, you know, not putting a high enough value on it, right? There are people who find time and money and, um, you know, just, you know, hours for all kinds of things. Uh, and then they say, oh, I have no time for temples. I have no time for federation. I have no time for, you know, Jewish learning or whatever it might be. It's not the time, more often than not. In rare circumstances, I will say, really people must not have the time to, or whatever, or the wherewithal to engage. Uh, in the Jewish community, especially because as a Jewish community, uh, about not only uh, TBI, but just generally speaking in the synagogue world, is that, you know, we have a dues-based system, there are financial components to it, but you want to come and do your thing, you can give us a penny and you're part of the synagogue. You know, the, the, the Jewish community has done that, not turning people away, uh, again, generally speaking, uh, for, for resources. So people can come and they can come and do uh, and be involved in the Jewish world. And again, there's very little reason they can. I think also that it, it sort of, to me, it says that you yourself are, are responsible to the community. Yes. Yeah, is that I would say, uh, if we're looking at the top five, top 10, whatever values that we're looking at here, uh, but the idea is, is that Kol Yisrael Aravim Zebezeh, that all of Israel is responsible for one another. Uh, and that Judaism, whether you're Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Haredi, whatever it might be, uh, we have to figure out how to interpret that, that idea and, what, and how do we balance the needs of the individual and the needs of the community. Because Judaism affirms the primacy of both. Uh, and that's what I think what makes it tricky, and you know, because we all have our individual wants and needs, but we pray in the plural. We 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 pray in the communal when we go to synagogue, uh, because we have communal needs and communal wishes. And where I might, you know, as an example, want one day might not be what the community needs, or the community might need me to be at some place. I'm not speaking as a rabbi; I'm speaking as a Jewish person. You know, the community might need me to do something. And I'm like, ah, I can do other things today, but is that where I'm supposed to be? Is that where, you know, the community needs me to be? Uh, and, I th and I think it's something that's, uh, again, very inherent in Judaism, the idea that we have to think about not only our own needs. Uh, we talked about it uh, this last week, imena uh, nili nili, you know, if I am not for myself, who is for me? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? You know, because you have to be uh, engaged in both. Your, your self benefit, you know, being, being uh, true to yourself and your individuality, but also recognizing we're part of something different. We're, we're, we're part of a community that dates back, you know, thousands of years. Uh, and there's communal obligation on us. And I use the word obligation very specifically, is that, that we have a responsibility uh, to the community as well. I think also that, uh, you know, the equation going the other way, the community offers something for the in individual. God bless, it should, yeah. Uh, you know, that, that you know, responsibility is that we have to offer something too. Uh, and that that's one of the hardest things to sell uh, to the 21st century, not only the 21st century Jew, but the 21st century person of faith uh, is that we have to sell something ephemeral, uh, is that we, we, you can't show somebody a bottle, you know, and saying, this is what you get for being part of a synagogue because you can't necessarily uh, put it down in, 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 the, in those transactional uh, terms that there's benefit uh, to being within a community of connection, 
of, um, of, of learning, of, of um, what I would say, you know, helping us become the people that we're meant to be. Since I'm a, a, a progress theologian. Uh, that I, I believe that, you know, that religion uh, is meant to lift us up. It's, it's, about, it's about making us the best people that we can be, that God desires for us to constantly be striving towards the good and towards the great and towards the holy, right? And that we can't do that by ourselves, that we need support, we need help, we need a community that's going to help push us, and help, help guide us and lead us and support us on our journey, right? Uh, and so the community offers something to that person and says, you, you, you become part of the community, we're going to help you. We're going to help you understand the great whys of life. Why this? Why that? We're going to help you make meaning. That's what the community offers. And, you know, in, in the noblest uh, of circumstances is that we, we help people make meaning uh, of their lives uh, Jewishly. You know, we, we add that. But, Jew you know, Rabbi, truly, as you said, Kol Yisrael Arabim Zebazet is such an all-encompassing yeah. term. Yes. It, it, it's totally encompassing. Yes. Totally encompassing uh, is that we have that um, responsibility to each other. Whether right. yeah, and it's 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 vital. It's a lifeblood. I mean, I I think is that understanding is that we have to be thinking about uh, our community uh, and the fact that we have a sacred responsibility. We are, as we learned again, one of the first lessons, right, uh, of the Torah. We get to Cain and Abel, you know, like uh, uh, we are, in fact, our brother's keepers. We are, in fact, you know, responsible for the welfare and the well-being of our community. Now, we're not allowed to be Jewish on an island by ourselves. We have to be Jewish within community. And that in, in, entails responsibility, certainly. And, and so many times we have to be taught that. Taught and, and, and reminded. Uh, and honestly. reminded, yeah, definitely because it doesn't always come easily to people and it doesn't always um, think uh, with the American perspective. Uh, and, and I think that that's, again, part of the struggle of American Judaism, not to you know, get too tangential, but the idea that American society prizes the individual, Judaism prizes the community. Uh, and, and as American Jews, we have to navigate that uh, our, ourselves. We have to be able to, uh, you know, both affirm our autonomy uh, and our individualism, uh, while also maintaining a sense of, of communal responsibility and engagement. Uh, and it, it's different than in other countries because of our emphasis on the individual here. Uh, in this I, I think our temple is doing a tremendous job of um, gathering the community together with lessons like this and, you know, with your leadership and, and everyone who's here today. I mean, I think the temple is really shining in a very difficult situation. Well, thank you for saying so. We're trying. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's certainly a very challenging moment for us all. And it's, it's trying to put one foot in front of the other and figure this stuff out uh, virtually. And God willing, keep on offering more opportunities because that's what we miss the most, I think. I speak for myself, I guess, but that I miss it. You know, I miss being around all of you, you know, physically. You know, this, this virtual world is, uh, we're trying, you know, uh, but I can't wait. I'll tell you, so the first Friday night back in the synagogue, it's going to be a good night. <laughs> it's going to be a good night. I'm, I'm really, like, looking forward to it, as I'm sure we all are. Yeah. Um, people, but, uh, yeah. people lived in... Uh, Europe, though maybe Western Europe, feel that the United States is more in interested in the individual for themselves, whereas in the socialist country, they want the best for everybody who is part of their country. Yeah, and as I say, American Judaism is its own thing, as one can argue, you know, about other countries, because uh, I, we, we, I guess we can all say that each country has its own flavor uh, of, of Judaism. Uh, but it's the American experience, I think, certainly, yeah, ha has that, uh, that balancing act uh, between the, and, and which, which is why, uh, as again, as a little bit of an aside, it's why Reform Judaism has flourished uh, in the United States more than any other country, right, is because Reform Judaism also affirms uh, the, the value and power uh, and the authenticity uh, of an individual. Uh, more than other uh, denominations. 
uh, and so other countries where they don't have that same uh, affirmation of the individual where form of Judaism uh, has not blossomed in the same way. It's growing, but it's different. It's, again, there's a reason why it developed here, as I'm just trying to say. It's not coincidental that Reform Judaism really, it started somewhere else, but it, it, uh, it, it really blossomed and flourished in America. Okay. Uh, this we know already. Let's get to some of this. Uh, yeah, this is what we were mentioning before, is that you shouldn't separate from the community, but rather share in the troubles, because you're going to be there uh, for better or for worse, for good and for bad. And then if you ditch the community in troubling times, then, you know, you, you don't get to sort of be uh, in the reward section when the synagogue congregation is doing well. Um, so we're sort of, if we're not for each other, then we're going to be alone and lost. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly right, is that, you know, we have to be able to turn to each other. Um, you know, when I think about community, I think about the idea of, you know, we're there for each other at Simchas and we're, for the joyous stuff, and we're there for each other in times of trouble, in times of, of sorrow, in times of loss, right? And that's part of, that's a, I think, a huge part of what it means to be part of a community, is that you're, we're there for each other through thick and thin, and that we're not fair weather, you know, we, we, we go through it together, we experience things together as a community. It becomes part of our uh, shared story. Because uh, we all, you know, we have people who have belonged to the temple, you know, for 30, 40, you know, 50 years, you know, more, right? Uh, and the temple story is part of their story, you know, uh, and each of us who have belonged to the temple forever long, you know, the temple is part of our story. And we are, as we are engaged in the synagogue, part of the synagogue story. Uh, and, and so I think that there's a lot of power to that. Okay. David, you want to give a little read? He Rabban, yeah, move us a little closer. He Rabban Gamaliel, mm -hmm. the son of Rabbi Judah Hanasi, used to say, "A brute is not sin-fearing, nor is an ignorant person pious, nor can a timid person learn, nor can an impatient person teach, nor someone who engages too much in business become wise." in a place where there are no people, strive to be a person. Okay. Okay. I tried to, to do a little bit more gender neutrality in this one. Those doesn't, doesn't always make it easier. Uh, so uh, we're gonna to, to focus on this idea of uh, a person being ashamed can't learn. Why, of course, is they don't ask questions, right? So if, if you're too worried to ask a question, uh, it, it makes it harder to learn. Uh, so I, I, I like that commentary on, on this, uh, that if, if you're timid, if you're shy, if it's hard for you to engage, it's harder to learn. Because we all don't have, we all have information we don't know, but we have to be able to ask. Uh, the patient person, of course, can't teach because they're gonna, you know, have trouble connecting to their students. So you see here, you know, a teacher who is impatient with his students when they ask questions cannot teach properly, but rather needs to be able to cheerfully explain the law uh, to the students and not, you know, throw something at them. Yeah, you have that story of Hillel and Shammai, right? The, the, those two sages early uh, in Jewish thought where the person comes to Shammai and says, teach me Torah while I stand on one foot. And Shammai grabs a stick, you know, and chases him uh, out of the study hall. And he goes to Hillel and, Hill, and asks Hillel, teach me Torah on one foot. Uh, and Hillel says, you know, what is hateful to you, don't do to other people. That's Torah, you know, go learn it. The rest is commentary. You know, uh, and so he's able to teach him on one foot what Torah is. It's basically, don't be, don't be a jerk. <laughs> don't be terrible. Uh, and everything else after that is, uh, is commentary. And then go and study it. And so, similarly, so that's what it's talking about there. Um, it talks about, about shame uh, already. The person who's embarrassed can't learn. Um, in the place where you know there is no man, if there's no person, it's an interesting expression, uh, and it has different interpretations. So one of the most common ones today 
Uh, and here's the commentary. If you see a generation wherein the Torah is slacking, stand up and strive with it. Uh, to me, this is about leadership. Uh, it's about the idea that if you are in a situation where no one is leading or things are, are, are going wrong, where it's just a mess, um, you look and think, okay, well, someone has to help. Someone has to fix things. Someone has to be the change. And that's where this comes in, uh, is ish. you should try to be a person. You know, uh, if you're surrounded by, by uh, Mishigas, you have to sometimes say, you know what, I'm not going to give in to that. I'm not going to just be part of the insanity. I'm going to try to help. I'm going to try to fix things. I'm going to try to make, make change. Uh, and so that's what I, you know, I like that verse, that idea, that sometimes this is a moment where it calls for leadership. It calls for, you know, being somebody who's going to get their hands dirty, get in the mix and try to, to uh, make things better and not just being apathetic and going, yeah, you know, forget it. Someone else will handle it. You know, no, we have to handle it. It's, it's our responsibility. I think the good example in the past was FDR with the depression. And then he didn't really want it, but he had to get into World War II because uh, Hitler has his own way for 15 years and then died and everything that's died with him. Mm, yeah, no, that's good. Let's take a look at two, Sandy, you there? Yep. Yeah. yeah, Sandy, uh, he was uh, accustomed. Okay. He was accustomed to say, the more flesh, the more worms, the more possessions, the more worry, the more wives, the more witchcraft, the more maidservants, the more lewdness. The more manservants, servants, the more theft. The more Torah, the more life. The more sitting and studying, the more wisdom. The more counsel, the more understanding. The more charity, the more peace. One who has acquired a good name has acquired something of value. One who has acquired words of Torah has acquired life in the world to come. Oh, thank you. Yes. Oh, it like a rabbinic text about a little bit of uh, Mishigas in it. Uh, the more wives, the more uh, we're not going to focus on that so much as one can guess. Uh, but certainly, again, there were concerns about uh, temptations, obviously, uh, and, uh, and, and things along those lines. Uh, but, and so the negative, again, we can understand that pretty easily, right? Uh, that back to the idea of excess, right? If you have too much excess of the wrong things, you're going to have problems. Whereas if you have more of the good stuff, uh, then it's going to be better for you. Uh, and so this idea that uh, too far, the more Torah, the more life. Uh, so he says it's the opposite, basically. It corresponds to the idea that there's more flesh and more vermin. Through enjoyment, right, through too much, uh, you know, frivolity, you, your days are going to be shortened. But through Torah study, uh, you'll have your days lengthened. Uh, and it gets, it runs through that idea that if you, the more possessions you attain, then you're stressed about guarding your possessions, right? And so that's going to give you stress and give you ajita and maybe shorten your life. Uh, what I love is they give you a little science in the end. It's the science of their day. Even though the wise ones of science have said the concern is sickness of the heart and worry is destruction of the heart, that's bad. But if you worry over Torah, that's better. If you, are, if you are concerned about Torah, then you'll do, uh, do better for yourself. But all this other stuff, you're concerned with earthly material possessions, it's going to give you service, you're going to have stress, you're going to have a heart attack, you don't want it, okay? Uh, so don't, uh, don't have so much stress about material stuff. That sounds like the uh, ultra-Orthodox in Israel who just want to spend all day praying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, going back to the extremes, right? Uh, where if you have this idea that you're just meant to be studying all day, that is the extreme. You're taking that verse that, that I did to the extreme, 100%. Where they might justify their actions for that reason. Where they can say, hey, you know, uh, I'm just meant to be studying Torah all day and I'll go in the yeshiva and study Torah all day. Uh, and, that, and that's what God wants of me. Oh, it's nine o'clock already. My goodness. Okay. <laughs> Let's see, I wanna finish with one here. Okay. 
this, uh, yeah, this is, I guess, near. Uh, 213. Uh, Marilyn, you want to pick up there? Sure. Rabbi, uh, Shimon. Rabbi, Shimon. Rabbi Shimon said, be careful with the reading of Shema and the prayer. And when you pray, do not make your prayer something automatic. Your plea for compassion before God. For it is said, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and renouncing punishment. And be not wicked in your own esteem. So a few uh, great ideas there which we'll finish up with. Uh, the idea of keva versus kavana is the Hebrew expression. Uh, keva meaning fixed, uh, and kavana meaning praying with uh, intention. And so Bartonura comes in with the idea that uh, when we pray, it can't be like rote. It can't be just be like you're reading it like you would read a passage in any book, you know, that you've read a hundred times, a thousand times, you know, forever in a day. It, it can't feel like that. You know, every time you recite uh, the Shema, every time you, you recite the Amidah, every time you recite Kaddish, uh, there should be intention there. Uh, and not feeling like it's just, oh, the same prayer that we read last week, the same old thing. Uh, there has to be uh, more to it. Uh, so it says uh, that you, you have to speak to it in, you know, through your heart. It has to be something like that is meaningful and evocative, and it can't just be same old stuff. And then he adds in this idea about being wicked in your own eyes that uh, do not do something that will cause you to consider yourself wicked today. I love this idea because it's so positive, right? Is that we all make mistakes, and you know, that's clear, right? Uh, it's not gonna be a problem uh, in, in acknowledging that, you know, that we all make mistakes, that we're all imperfect, but we shouldn't consider ourselves to be wicked beings. Judaism affirms obviously that each of us has inherent worth and value uh, and that we should not be so hard on ourselves, even when we make the mistakes, even when we have a problem, you know, we should make, oh, I'm such a bad person, I'm such a bad Jew, I'm such a bad whatever it is. Because if you do that to yourself too much, uh, you're going to actually, again, be more self-fulfilling. You're going to maybe, you know, act uh, in, 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 a, in a bad way. And you're going to separate yourself from the community, which is the lifeblood, God willing, of you know doing good things, of helping uh, raise us up to be better people. So uh, we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves. Uh, Yon is going to speak similarly. And, you know this idea: that prayer needs to be emotional. It needs to be from the heart, and it can't just be you know, going through the motions. Uh, that we have to do it in such a way that is meaningful to us. It shouldn't feel like a burden, you know, or that something that we're obligated to do. It should feel like a blessing. It should feel like a, like something that we're doing uh, from uh, from the, the the deepest goodness within us. Uh, and so I think that's really a great message. Uh, and so Pirkei Avot, as we can see, just to wrap up, it has all these really wonderful expressions, wonderful sayings. Some of them are you know a little harder, uh, honestly, you know, because uh, you know they, we might not always think in the same way. But I think it, it's always good for conversation. Uh, to have us think about, well, what does God want, you know, from us? What do we expect from ourselves uh, in terms of how do we live as, uh, as individuals, as members of a community? What does it mean to live a meaningful, uh, engaged Jewish life? Uh, and so I think it's uh, a really great study text. And I think it's, that's why during Passover and Shavuot during this time, we're meant to be reading it because it does make us think about what does it mean uh, to be Jewish, uh, not only then, but today. So thank you all very much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. That was interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. We're going to be here same time uh, next week. Uh, different prophet, different chapter of uh, Pirkei mm -hmm. Avot. So we'll be doing same as the first. Okay. Uh, but we'll say a yeah, same bat time, same bat channel as we say. There we go. Uh, okay. So, Thank you. Have a good night. Bye, bye, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye, bye. Stay safe. Stay well. Stay well. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.